welcome. Welcome. Thanks very much for being here this evening. Please take your seats. I'm Jim Sturgis. I'm the executive director of Pioneer Institute, and I want to welcome all of you to our 11th annual Colby Hewitt Healthcare Lecture, which I think is fitting recognition of a man who did so much to build Pioneer Institute as his chairman and someone who put so much of his life into building the capacity of what is today a medical mecca for the state, for the country, and the world, Colby Hewitt. Let me begin with four thank yous. Thank you to the Hewitt family. To start, I'd like to thank Chuck and Teak. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, John Marston, thanks for being here. And Colby and Jennifer, thank you for being here. Second thank you is to tonight's sponsors. Pfizer, we're deeply appreciative for your support. Vitals and Fred and Barbara Clifford, the Hewitt family again, and Gary and Susan Kearney. We'd also like to thank the steering committee for this evening's event. Fred Clifford, Mel Klaus, Chuck Hewitt, Fred Hochberg, Gary Kearney, Gerard Mouflet, and Greg Stone. Thank you very much. So if I could just say one more thank you, it is to the medical school and to the staff for always making this a tremendous event for us. We really appreciate what you do. So the, the Hewitt Lecture was established in 2006. Since that time, we have collectively witnessed sweeping changes in healthcare. It's been a remarkable and frankly an unsteady and troubling time. Along the way, this lecture has featured some of the country's most talented leaders and researchers to provide insights into Romney care, Obamacare, <laughs> cost containment, price and cost transparency, Medicaid reform, the health uh, finance and delivery models of other countries. We've talked about all the different aspects of policy, sweeping changes. Our health care, excuse me, our, we've, we've discussed in depth even the opioid crisis, if you think about it, last year. Uh, and talked about how we can collaborate, train our doctors, and allocate our resources better. Tonight, at the federal level, we have a battle over what you might call big policy. And it kind of limps along, and people don't talk to each other. It will have a huge impact on reshaping our healthcare market once more. So often, we lose sight of the stuff that's actually happening right in front of our eyes, and that's what we're going to focus on tonight, and that is a lot of innovation on the delivery side of healthcare, the industry here in Massachusetts and in the United States. Policymakers often react to new approaches in the healthcare space the way bureaucrats think about Lyft or Uber. At best, by kind of scrambling to keep their heads above water, do we actually understand what the hell they're doing? And at worst, by putting up really unhelpful barriers to market entrance. Pioneer believes that if we are to improve the quality and the cost of care, innovation in the delivery of healthcare needs needs to be embraced. The key is not to view it in a pre preconceived way where we say, this is about cost, we're gonna lower cost. Uh, it is not about just quality, it's actually about those two things. It's about value. What's the value we're getting? And often, if you think about even one of those markets we, we refer to when we think about new market entrants, our cell phones. <coughs> Look, folks, we're all paying more, right? But we're getting a hell of a lot better service. We're getting immediate service. And I think to some degree, if we can come to a place where we have costs that are lower for higher quality, we would all embrace that. And it may actually lead to spending a little more on healthcare. I think we've got this binary position where we talk about we're going to save money, we're going to get better quality as if the two are disconnected. They're not. Getting to both, getting to value, means new market entrance. Pioneer believes that if we are going to improve both, innovation that we're going to be talking about tonight is something that we have to, have to embrace. That's why the Institute's work over the past couple of years has really sought to advance the cause of price transparency in the healthcare market. Ditto for much of our work on governmental barriers to market entry, such as regulation affecting scope of practice, or the state's role in restricting who gets to participate in the market and how. It's an important conversation that we will have tonight, and it is one with immediate real-life consequences on the cost, quality, and yes, ultimately access 
to care. Our healthcare team has assembled for us tonight a wonderful group, which will be led by Paul Levy in a conversation. So let's get started. It is my pleasure to introduce our panel moderator, Paul Levy. Uh, he's a healthcare leader who knows, I think, a fair amount about innovation. I think he also knows something about how difficult it is to innovate in big institutions. Paul is a former CEO of Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, serving from 2002 to 2011. Previously, he was an adjunct professor at MIT's Department of Urban Studies and Planning from 1992 to 1998. Executive Director of the Massachusetts Water Resource Authority from 1987 to 1992, and Chairman of the Department of Public Utilities prior to that. He will be moderating a conversation with Dr. Tobias Barker, who is the Chief Medical Officer of CVS Minute Clinic. Thank you for being here. Faye Donahue, who is an Advanced Leadership Initiative Fellow at Harvard University. Faye, thank you for being here. Dr. Rashika Fernandapol, who wants to change the world <laughs> and is CEO of Iora Health. Thanks, thank you for being here. And Rob Graybill, who is Vice President of Product and Sales Strategy for Vitals, which has an absolutely terrific pilot underway here in Massachusetts. We hope to hear more about that. Paul. Thank you, Jane. <clears throat> Thank you, Jim. It's an honor to be here, and uh, I'd like to welcome you to my building. Um, what's left out of the bio is that I was actually administrative dean of Harvard Medical School when this building was built. <clears throat> and we had great plans, including a plan to raise about $150 million in philanthropy to pay for the building. And um, you'll, although this room is called the Martin Conference Center, the building is still called the New Research Building. That is not the name of a donor. So Harvard <laughs> is still looking in the event. <clears throat> Anyone's got 150 million of spare change lying around. Um, but first, make your donation to Pioneer Institute, if you would. <clears throat> now. <clears throat> It's, it's a special honor and pleasure for me to be here at the Colby Hewitt Healthcare Lecture because I knew Colby well and I loved him. Um, anyone who knew Colby loved him. He was personable, funny, but in my position at Beth Israel Deaconess, he was also a member of, of one of our, of, of our boards and was <clears throat> incredibly supportive of me personally and of the, <clears throat> the mission of our organization. And um, so I, I had a chance to spend a lot of time with him. But it wasn't until his memorial service that I learned the thing about him that has stuck with me all these years. Now, this may feel a little politically incorrect, this story, but you have to understand that he was a person of a different generation, right, Chuck? And this, this was okay. So Colby was kind of a bit of a ladies man. He, he liked the attention of pretty young women or even older women whenever possible. <laughs> and what he would do at a cocktail reception like this or at a party, he, he, had, he wore button down shirts and he would unbutton one of the tabs of his shirt <laughs> so that a pretty young lady would come up and say, oh, Colby, your button's unbuttoned. And she'd come over and fasten the button, and they would then have a nice conversation. <laughs> he would then turn away and unbutton the button <laughs> again. And, and he would spend the evening doing that. True story, right, Chuck? True story. So that, that to me... He didn't do that well? Okay. <laughs> but <clears throat> he, was, he was as fine a fine person as you could ever know. Uh, I put him in my top ten list of all, of all time of people I just love to be with for who he was and for what he stood for. So it, it's just a great pleasure <clears throat> to be here. Our topic tonight is evolving healthcare delivery models, <clears throat> which which means we have to first, we're gonna have a series of questions for our panelists. Oh, by the way, uh, unlike usual conferences where the audience only gets to ask questions at the end, 
we're going to have a couple questions with our panelists, and then I'm going to stop and give you a chance to ask questions or make observations, and then we'll go on again there. So you'll get to play tonight. <clears throat> um, I think it's important to, to think about how we got to the current healthcare delivery model. Um, and, and for this, I, I, I found a cartoonist in Melbourne, Australia, who, who has come up with the answer. His name is Jib Lunig. Lunig. And this is his depiction of how we got to where we are. Okay. It might apply to other fields as well. But, but I, I think it's a pretty accurate depiction. Of, we, get, we get this society, we organize things, we construct a framework, and then all of a sudden we find ourselves boxed in. Now, the four panelists tonight are doing what they can to think outside of that box. And we're going to hear from them. They have a lot of interesting things to tell us. They're very interesting people in them, of themselves, not only their ideas and their ventures, but very interesting people. And we're going to ask a little personal questions about how they got here. Um, but we're going, to, uh, we're going to start with the first question, which is, which is this. Why are we even here? What's wrong with the traditional healthcare delivery model? Tobias, you want to start us off? Sure. Can everyone hear me? Great. Never know if these are working. So, what's wrong with the, the current healthcare system? I'm not certain there's anything particularly wrong with the current healthcare system. I think it's more a matter of malalignment with the current healthcare system compared to what the um, priorities and, and um, expectations of the public are. So you, you've got all aspects of our lives have changed over the past decade or so with technology. And I think it's, it's uh, I think the concept of receiving health care at the location that someone else chooses, at the time someone else chooses, and expecting that to fit into your life is something that banking and shopping and everyone, you know, all the other aspects of our lives have, have done away with. And so I think it's, um, you know, part of, part of the problem is just this really, this malalignment between what we're expecting, what today's population is expecting versus what the current healthcare system is really delivering. So that's, that's probably part of it at least. Okay, Faye? Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm gonna frame it um, from where I sit, which is in the world of oral health. And we have essentially two diseases in oral health, cavities, caries, and gum disease. They are chronic, infectious diseases. They are virtually 100% preventable. We spend $120 million a year on treating the symptoms of those chronic diseases in a surgical approach instead of treating the underlying diseases. Now, since this is a mixed audience, give me two minutes to explain what I'm talking about, and I'm gonna take tooth decay. So you've got a tooth. This is so simplistic. So if you're a scientist, you know, bear with me, or, or a physician. Um, so you've got the bacteria, there's good bacteria in your mouth, and there's bad bacteria. This is the bad bacteria. It gets some sugar, it chomps away, it produces an acid. The acid then starts eating into your tooth. It's a process. From beginning to end, it takes about four years. It is a reversible process. We know how to remineralize it. We know how to make it better, but instead what we do is we take the tooth, we cut all the good stuff around that little decaying part, we fill it with a filling. Then that falls out and we put a bigger filling in. And then that falls out and we put a, mm, maybe a four surface amalgam. Then, eh, failure, crown. Then the crown doesn't work and you get a root canal. And then at some point you might have to have the tooth pulled and then you get a bridge or an implant. This was not only like preventable in the first place, but it could have been remineralized with something like fluoride toothpaste. I'll go into a little more. Great, thank you. Rashika. Yeah, and so I think there are a lot of amazing things that uh, our health system does. I mean, even in the time I've been a doctor, uh, just the uh, technology we have and the tools and the drugs, are miraculous what we do. Uh, I think it's not the what we do, it's the how we actually deliver it to people that's awful. And part of it, we haven't innovated it. We're doing it the same way. What happens when you want to see a doctor? You 
you pick up the phone by and large, you call, you wait on hold, you go through a phone tree, you schlep in, you wait in the waiting room for two hours, you get in, you put a paper gown on, you wait beside the bed for another hour, a doctor comes in for seven minutes, he's standing, you're sitting with your back open to the wind, uh, does something, jots something on a piece of paper, and these days <laughs> use a computer, but he's facing away from you. Right, right? this process is awful, right? And I think the, the result of it really is that the experience of care is just crazy, again, compared to what we experience in any other industry. We would never tolerate that. I think the, by the way, the experience of being a doctor is awful too, right? It's not like we're liking this either, right? I think the, um, the outcomes are embarrassingly poor. So hypertension, good example. You know, we know good and well how to treat hypertension, what sort of dietary interventions we have. We have amazing drugs to treat hypertension. What percentage of, and we know if we don't do it, we end up with strokes and kidney failure and heart attacks and blindness and all sorts of badness. How often do we do it in this country? About 64% of the time. 64%, that's embarrassing. We're just 36% failure rate in any other industry there'd be, you know, <laughs> people up in our, and then the costs are just obscene. One thing, if we did this on the cheap, this is three and a half trillion dollars. It is bankrupting the country. If you look at federal budget deficits over the next 50 years, it is all Medicare and Medicaid. If you look at the state budget, uh, Medicaid has crowded out spending on education and roads and everything else. It's the number one cause of bankruptcy. Um, it, is, it is eating all the wage growth in the country, right? So I think there are a whole lot of very deep problems. And again, a little foreshadow what I'll talk about, thinking we can fix it with, by putzing around the edges, I think is fooling ourselves, right? We need to start over. Thanks, Rashika. Rob? So I, I agree with what uh, my fellow panelists have said. I, my view is we've got Good healthcare. You know, people fly from all over the world to come here for healthcare because they believe it's really good. The problem is we all can't afford it. So we have a cost problem, not a healthcare problem, in my opinion. So the analogy that I would use is you go and you buy a car. You go to the dealership and you see a car you like and say, that, that's the car that I want. And the, the salesperson says, great, I'm going to write up the paperwork. You take that car today. I'm going to send you the bill two weeks from now. How's that sound? You don't buy anything else that way, but healthcare you buy as a consumer, getting two, three, four, five, six bills, four, five, six weeks after. By the time you get the price of something, you can't even remember what it was you had done in the first place. So what we're trying to do is actually train people to be consumers in healthcare. So we have a lot of great solutions around different delivery models for the physicians, different delivery models for the site of care where people can access and convenience. What we're trying to do is get to the end patient and get them to behave like a consumer. So we'll talk more about some models that we've got, uh, but that is one component to what we think is going to help to solve that healthcare cost problem uh, in both this state as well as across the country. Thanks, Rob. <clears throat> so I'm, as, as a person who's studied a lot of industries over the years, um, what you all have described as problematic it seems to me in other industries has often been solved by a process of disintermediation between customers and, uh, and, and the, the portions of the delivery system that get in their way. So in, 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 we've seen this on the web, obviously, and in, ma in many other respects. Is that what the problem is here? Is it is that there's too much distance? I'm not talking physical distance. I'm talking institutional, financial, knowledge distance between what we as people want and expect and the delivery system. Is that is that what you were talking about, Tobias? Or am yeah, I getting I it wrong? Others can jump in here too. Go yeah. Ahead. Yeah, I think I think that's exactly right. I think that the I think that the the healthcare system is really is really as as is oftentimes the case, kind of the last to follow what the what the you know patient centered or consumer centered in every other industry is the consumer centered uh, approach to kind of life is to make things more accessible, um, higher quality, and and as inexpensive as possible. And that's been done in almost everything except healthcare. So, Faye, is the problem the priesthood? Is it the priesthood of, of dentists and doctors that's keeping that from happening? Yeah, partially, because you start with the consumer, the patient, who has no knowledge at all. <laughs> and so th that's very different than when I go to buy a car. 
I can try, but I don't know. I, people come to me all the time and say, I love my dentist. And I always go, why? And they say, well, the front desk is so nice. Um, you know, they, they don't know how to evaluate. They have no understanding of it. And you have this huge system that's built that makes money, where people are working, doing well, and it doesn't have an incentive to change particularly much if it's going to go away in some sense. And I think you've got both of those factors at the moment. Rashika, you're a member of the guild here. Yeah, I know. You're, you're, you're one of the priests. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, what, what's going on? Why is this happening? So I think we have a disconnect. I think you're exactly right that the core of this, and so it was, why is this not happening in other industries? It's because we have consumer agency. Right, that consumers have agency to be able to rationalize the system. Okay. I think there are a whole host of reasons why the healthcare system doesn't allow that to happen. Right, so I think number one is this third-party payment. The issue you said that you're not even paying at the time, but even if you try and ask for the payment and the information, no one will give it to you. I think there are, you know. Um, uh, there's huge information asymmetries, right. which you talked about, right? When you come in, you know, these are complicated things. I think it's regret theory. You don't want to even make the decision yourself because you worry what if it got wrong. Mm -hmm. I think there are monopolies, you know, where you don't really have a lot of choice among things. Not here in Boston. Yeah, yeah, it's particularly not here in Boston. <laughs> there aren't monopolies right. here. But, but I think for a whole host of reasons. So, so what we're doing, the core of what we're doing is saying, if you think a consumer won't be able to do this themselves, maybe they need someone on their side who can help them. And that's sort of maybe a role what a primary care doctor can do, right? Because we actually do understand. Now, unfortunately, most doctors, it's a dirty little secret, don't work for the patient, right? Their incentives and that of the patient are often misaligned. Uh, I think it's actually criminal in some cases, right? That the, this sort of conflict of interest in other industries would never be allowed. But, um, you know, the doctor makes money. Can, can I tell a story? Sure. So, so a, a little story that sort of illustrates this to me completely. So we had a little practice uh, we set up in Arlington, our first practice uh, about 10 years ago. And uh, it was, uh, we wanted to get out of this and become agents. We said, well, let's get rid of third party payment. Let's have pay patients pay us a fixed fee, 40 bucks a month, and we'll work for you, right? So we did that. And a, a gentleman came to us and said, can I, um, can I sign my mother up for your practice? She lives in New Jersey. And I was like, sure, uh, two rules. Uh, she needs, I need to meet her and she needs to agree. And like, why? Well, I don't trust her doctor in New Jersey. I want someone to help me. So she comes up, little old lady, a uh, little diabetes, a little hypertension, a little arthritis, a couple of medications, doing fine. So I wish her luck, give her my number. And I get a call uh, a few weeks later from the gentleman. And he said, my mom's about to get a pacer, a pacemaker. I was like, really? She seemed fine when I saw her. What's the story? Well, can you call her and find out? I was like, sure. Right. So Ma, call the mother. Here's what happened. The mother had gone to the bathroom one day, looked in the toilet bowl, and a little red in the toilet bowl. And she, like a good doobie, she went to her primary care doctor and said, Doc, I noticed red in the toilet bowl. Her primary care doctor, but you're not supposed to do, turned his brain off and said, red toilet bowl. This could be blood. This could be cancer. You should go see a urologist. <laughs> So she goes to the urologist. The urologist said, ma'am, this could be cancer. I need to do a cystoscopy. Put a tube up your urine and look in your bladder. But because you're old, I have to send you a cardiologist to get cardiac clearance. Go to a cardiologist. So goes to the cardiologist, right? So I, I asked, by the, by the way, what happened to the blood in the urine? Or the red in the urine? Oh, it went away, right? I was like, OK. Um, by the way, the most common cause of red in the urine is? Beets. Beet urea, exactly. Probably had a beet salad, right? It's all a, it could be a, a little hemorrhoid, a little bit of UTI, but again, in any case, she's in the vortex of the U.S. healthcare system, right? <laughs> so now the cardiologist uh, nurse does a little review of systems. Ma'am, do you ever feel weak or dizzy? Sometimes I feel a le little weak or dizzy, Sonny, you know. Put a Holter on her, which is the monitor that tracks her heartbeat over time. So she's not got a Holter monitor on her, right? And by the way, it's a problem that doesn't even exist, right? So Holter notices that she gets what's called asymptomatic bradycardia at night. Her heart rate goes in the 50s when she goes to sleep. The cardiologist walks in, ma'am, this could be dangerous, nurse schedule her for a pacer. So I'm like, wait a second. First of all, this is not even a problem. This is probably beat urea. Secondly, um, I call a friend of the cardiologist at Mass General. Is this an indication? No, no, no. Asymptomatic bradycardia at night is not an indication for a pacer. She's probably had it for a long time. The risk of sticking a huge croaker in her groin and putting machinery in her is so much higher than a non-problem. And I said, by the way, look at her medication list, her antihypertensive with a beta blocker, which slows your heart rate down. So I was like, come on. Oh. So I called the cardiologist. I said, I work, I'm a doc. I work with a family. I, we respectfully decline your pacer. Next time, look at the med list before you schedule people. He's like, I was about to do that, right? And so the, the son said, you know, doc, um, does that urologist make money off the cystoscopy? And I said, well, I don't want to say it's why he did it, but yes, he does. <laughs> and he said, and does that cardiologist make money off the holter? I said, yes, he does. Does it make money off the pacer? Yes, he does. He said, what I love about you is you work for me. You don't have a dog in this race. And I think this is these fundamental um, 
disconnects we've set up in the system. Thank you. Um, I want to move on to the next question. And after this question, I'm going to open this up for some comments from you in the audience. But uh, before that, I have to tell a, a similar story that didn't get that direction. Uh, several years ago, I had signed up to take a, um, a sea kayaking trip to, in Patagonia, in Chile. And, and the organization uh, re required that if you were above a certain age, you'd have to have a stress test. So I went to my primary care doctor, Amy Shipp, here at Beth Israel Deaconess. And I was president of the hospital at the time. And she <laughs> said, uh, I refuse to authorize a stress test. <laughs> and she said, why? I said, why? And, and she said, well, here's the thing. You're the president of the hospital. You're going to go in for a stress test. They're going to find some little irregularity <laughs> in your heartbeat that's been there your entire life. There's, there's no history of heart disease in your family. You know, you ride 100 miles a week on your bicycle. There's no reason to think there's a problem. But they'll find some irregularity, yeah. and as a result of that, they'll cath you. Yeah. And then the next thing you know, you'll be having open heart surgery. Yeah. And so she, she said, so I refuse to let that happen. Good for her. Just, Good for her. She just signed the form right there. Yeah. Uh, OK, um, let's start with Rob. Rob, there's, there's time for a personal question for, okay. each, for each of you, uh, because I'd like the audience to get to, to know you a little bit and, and why you're here. And, and so the question is, why are you here? I don't mean here tonight. <laughs> you're here tonight you because, invited me. That's exactly yeah, because why I came. the refreshments were going to be good. And, uh, <laughs> um, but why are, you, why are you personally involved in yeah. this, in what you're doing? What, what led you here? What created the passion for you? Because knowing what each of you is doing, mm -hmm. this is a full-fledged investment of your life and time at this portion of your life. This is not something you each do casually. So what's created the passion for you to be involved in this field in this way at this time? Rob? Um, so I, I guess I would describe it as uh, my wife herniated her back doing hot yoga. <laughs> so anyone that tells you that wellness is good for you, don't buy it. Yeah. It's, not, <laughs> it's not true. It cost me a lot of money out of pocket. So uh, to what Dr. Shika was saying, my PCP is um, employed by the hospital system, right? I have a hospital-owned doc, which I live in New Hampshire. 90-plus um, percent of the docs are employed by the hospital system. So I go see my doc. It's a foregone conclusion where they're going to recommend that I go. Yeah. So my wife um, herniates a disc in her spine. We talk to our doctor. Next thing you know, we're scheduled at the hospital MRI down the hall. The, the soft music is playing. The candle is lit. It's $2,200 out of my pocket for a uh, high deductible HSA. I know that because of what I do. No one else knows that. So my wife um, loves me enough that she said, well, there are other options. And so I trusted my marriage and my wife's spine to the absolute cheapest place in New Hampshire. So she had uh, MRI of the lumbar spine for 571 bucks all in. So we avoided thousands of dollars that we didn't have to pay for really, really high quality care. So what I'm in the business of doing is getting people to understand that you have choice, you have options. Uh, we're really fortunate at, at our organization. Uh, I get to wake up every, every day and send people checks in the mail. So we send people checks in the mail that shop and then vote with their feet and go to the right place. So last year we sent out about a million eight in incentive rewards to our consumers across the country. So we're really excited about what we do. Uh, and that's my personal story of kind of what gets me uh, up every morning is really just making sure that the, the image you described about the person in the box to help them understand that they can get out of the box and be able to assist them in that process. Good. Rashika, why did you betray the priesthood and make this move? <laughs> so I still remember it was, a, uh, it was a day in February. As you know, it gets dark. At, it sounds, seems like 3.30, it's probably 4. And uh, I had uh, been working at a practice at a academic and medical center here in town not to be named. And, uh, you know, seeing patients, 38 patients booked and, you know, double booked during lunch and barely had time to go to the bathroom. And they had just put a new electronic health record in, which was a pain in the neck and you had to do all these points and clicks and I couldn't, and no one really could finish their notes. So you had to wait two hours after you finished practicing to fill out the little checks so you wouldn't get yelled at for not meeting your RVUs and your meaningful use and, and all that. And I had a colleague who was sitting there with me and, and we were just sitting there and, and I remember very clearly, she said, Rashika, every day I lose a little piece of my soul. Mm. 
And she just articulated what I was feeling. Mm -hmm. Every day I lose a little piece of my soul. We went into this because we want to help people. And people come to us, and they have such big needs. And we have such, oh, we've done years of training to sort of help them, but the system doesn't let us. There's all this crap that's been in the system that we have to do that's not aligned with actually helping people. Uh, and I was like, you know, you're right. Like, I, this system doesn't work, right? And, and I was at the time, you know, in my 30s. And I said, can I see myself doing this for 30 more years? And the answer is absolutely not. And I said, I could complain about it, like most doctors do. I could quit and become a writer, or I could try and fix the problem. So that's really what sort of set me on this. Yeah. Hey, hey. Yeah. So I usually say um, that I'm passionate about improving oral health, and I kind of watch eyes glaze over, and <laughs> people look around and pray that I'm not going to ask them if they frost or brush. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I then sort of take a deep breath and say, um, did you know that uh, poor teeth are the number one reason we don't send reservists overseas mm. because their teeth are so bad? Mm. Hmm. Did you know that 25% of all Americans are walking around with untreated decay? I mean, this isn't when the little you know, germs are there. This is untreated decay that hasn't been looked at, 25%. Do you know that one out of every 10 minority kids in kindergarten today is in pain from a toothache? So how do you learn? You care about defense. You should think about this. If you, if you care about getting a job, try to get a job without teeth. It is an outrageous situation, and this is where I get angry, I get passionate. It is so outrageous because this is so easy to fix. We know how to prevent it, we know what to do. But this is impacting millions of people and they are suffering. In long-term care, you know, 70% of the people have untreated decay and 40% of the people in long-term care facilities are acute, uh, urgent, severe situations, and nobody looks at their no. teeth. <laughs> so that's my passion. We can change this. Ooh. Yeah. Teeth. Wow. Now are you more interested in teeth? I am. I, I want to learn more. I want, I want to get more facts about teeth. <laughs> I'm going to nice. floss It more is tonight. good to floss and brush. <laughs> So the uh, so so with me it, it was uh, so I'm an emergency room doctor and I've practiced in Connecticut and in California, and in Ohio and in and in Massachusetts, and one common thread in all of those places is that there are they're very crowded, it's not very convenient to um, to be seen if you're in one of these emergency mm -hmm. rooms, and a lot of the people who are facing this inconvenience are there for things that they really didn't need to be there for because they were unable to really access health care in any other, you know, any other more appropriate venues. They're there in the emergency room for a sore throat that they had a... Teeth, 27,000 a month, a year. What is teeth? Teeth, dental. People go into emergency rooms, 37,000. Yeah. <laughs> totally preventable. <laughs> you, think, you think she cares about that? <laughs> well, I just wanted to tell you, like, unnecessary use of emergency rooms. This was a good I, moment. It was, it, there's a lot of dental. That's true. There's a lot there of dental is. emergencies as well. Yeah. They come in. I mean, they come in for a lot of reasons, and a lot of them don't need to be there. And they, and, and and so that's that's um and it's not their fault. Like it's in, it's a difficult to find access to healthcare, and and once they are there, then they get a a bill for a sore throat, which is 600, 800 or more dollars, and that they get two weeks later. And they didn't know that when they went in there. I mean, who would think a sore throat would be $800? Uh, and so when, when uh, so it was just a not natural philosophic fit. For me, having kind of lived this and seeing these patients every day, um, when I joined Meta Clinic five some years ago, to be able to say, you know, I'm going to really do something around trying to make healthcare more convenient, you know, more accessible, more transparent, so people know what they're paying, um, and and so that's, I guess, kind of a big part of what led me into this. Great, thank you. Um, I'd like to give you all a chance to ask questions or make comments, and as a foreshadowing, the next question each of these people is going to get, which you can help them answer better is the following. Each of you has been or are currently involved in offering the public a revised model of care. What are the key attributes of the model you're offering? What I'd like you to do, if you're willing, is to stand up, perhaps tell an experience you had that was indicative of that box I showed earlier that was problematic for you and offer to these folks what you're hoping for as an improvement, if you're willing to do that. 
If not, you can ask anything you want. Come on up. There's a microphone there. Is that Tom? Uh, thank you. I, I don't have a personal story, but we've heard some really trenchant criticisms of the system we have now, which is terrible. But I, I just, what I was looking for was if there's time for each of you to describe briefly what kind of system you would design that would be financially sustainable and would cover most or all people. Okay, we'll get that. <laughs> Sir. This isn't a personal story either, but as I heard the description, <clears throat> why does a sore throat cost $800 in an emergency? <laughs> <laughs> Personal story. Uh, I can. Really? Let me just give a quick answer to that. By the way, it's the teeth, Paul. That's it's it's all teeth. It's it's teeth. It all comes down to yes. teeth. All involved. In the teeth. Uh, if you read uh, Clay Christensen's book, uh, The Innovator's Prescription, he points out that <clears throat> general hospitals, in general, not only academic medical centers but general hospitals, have about nine dollars worth of overhead for every dollar of service delivered. Think about any other business in the world <laughs> trying to operate that. Way. So the answer to your question, in short, speaking as an economist, is you have a terrific problem of joint and common costs that have to be recovered. And they just get allocated to these different services in a random kind of way, somewhat random kind of way, certainly an arbitrary kind of way. And it's like the, uh, the proverbial hammer that the Defense Department buys from a defense contractor. You know, it's a $300 hammer. Well, the hammer actually isn't $300, but they're paying so much in overhead that it gets allocated to the hammer. But more to come on that. Yes. A personal story, you know, we deal with a lot of business, uh, personal expenses in healthcare, very much like Toby mentioned. And uh, the problem is, uh, what Rashid sort of pointed to it was, as a consumer, I wait until everything hits the HSA or my benefits admin. And at that point in time, then I'll begin to negotiate. So at what point does the consumer allow for that moment, that transaction to say, this is not a very good experience, mm -hmm. right? So I'd like you to address the, uh, the nuances of the transaction for payment, and, and, uh, instantaneous, like we are buying something. Yeah, good, good. By the way, I have a rule that when I get a bill for medical services, I never pay. <laughs> no, I just wait a few months and it, it disappears. <laughs> Over here, yes. Uh, I had a personal experience with Minute Clinic about four years ago, that's when I discovered them. So my question really is for Tobias. What was it, uh, from a business perspective, that made it possible for Minute Clinic to happen and presumably make money because they're still in business? Was it financial, regulatory, legal, um, I don't know what, but what made it work? <clears throat> Before they've you gradually cut, cut back on the salary of the chief medical officer. Yeah. That's how but they're balancing. Before, no, before yeah. Tobias <laughs> answers that question, my mind's directed to Tobias. I, and I, I want to, my disclaimer is that I don't own stock in CVS. But um, as we know in eastern Massachusetts, everybody in this room, it's almost impossible to find an internist. Um, everybody's panels are completely filled. And CVS is provided, with the exception of Boston, when Mayor Menina wouldn't let CVS many clinics in Boston, Massachusetts come in. And now you have 1,300 plus CVS clinics around the country where you're taking uh, physician extenders, nurse practitioners, uh, physician's assistants, putting them in an environment, in a pharmacy, and it's been enormously successful in providing, getting people out of the emergency room and in a cost-effective manner with the transparency. So what I'd like to know is to tell us here in this audience is your competition, what your expansion views are, and I would see this as the national extension in areas where physicians aren't common, like in eastern Massachusetts, where the density of physicians is so high. And <clears throat> what, is, what do you see out there in the landscape in your area, Mini Clinic, your competition, and what is the next steps for a CVS, a Walgreens, and those others? Okay, it's, it's a publicly traded company, so he's got to be careful of those answers. Okay. Molly. Hi, Molly Store, medical student, seen some things. Um, so my, um, my experience was I spent a year working in the community health centers uh, branches of Mass General Hospital in Chelsea and Revere. 
And while these patients are able to gain access to some of the best physicians in the state and country, um, they aren't able, a, a big barrier to their care was access to medications and paying for those. Um, and I'm just curious what sort of, um, what transparency is being done for medication access. Great, Thanks. two more questions, yes? Uh, regarding uh, shopping for uh, uh, less expensive, for example, tests, I uh, wasn't um, sleeping well, I was tired, I went to see a neurologist, it took a tremendously long time to get the appointment, and then um, he said that I needed a, a sleep study, and um, he made it with the um, at MGH, the hospital uh, where he's a neurologist, <laughs> and, um, and right up, uh, like the day of, then I waited quite a while for the appointment, the day of, uh, hours before you, know, they said, "Oh yeah, we we we've run this uh, through, and um, uh, you aren't getting the uh, clearance from Blue Cross Blue Shield. It's the t top tier Blue Cross Blue Shield program, and like it's not a cheap. Anyways, um, uh, they said that they won't do it at MGH, and so then we had to reschedule. They said they would pay to do it at the Somerville Hospital. I'd never heard of the Somerville Hospital, but I found it, um, and they <laughs> they did have a." a uh, a room where they did a sleep lab and they hooked me up, I did the thing, um, it got the results uh, back to them, um, I had the neurology appointment, took like, this is like like six months, uh, and, and you know, he got uh, them and he said, well, uh, you know, you, I, 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 you uh, have uh, no, you know, it's an REM um, disorder thing that, you know, we think you have, and, They've just tested you for the, uh, you know, to see if I needed a CPAP. <laughs> and, um, and uh, you know, what they don't offer at the Somerville Hospital is the thing where they look at your eyes, you know, the, the REM thingy. But they do with the master. So then I had to do it again. So they wound up, I mean, Blue Cross had to, they wound up paying twice. And then, you know, one of the appointments that was so hard to get, nobody got in uh, at the last minute because... I mean, they had like a no-show pretty much that night. And so I, I'm not understanding exactly how, uh, it, it, like how much knowledge would you need to even shop? Okay. Uh, be, because the, because the, the HMOs don't know. Okay. Yeah. Lest you think that's an example of inefficiency in the health system, think about it in a, bro in a broader sense, that the, the United States is twice as efficient as any other country in extracting money from all yeah. of the other sectors of the economy <laughs> and sending it to the healthcare sector. Yeah, now that's that. a real accomplishment. Yeah. I know it's complicated. Yes. So I too have one more uh, shopping for care story. So I'm relatively young, I'm relatively healthy. I'm, in, I'm insured by my employer, who's a large Boston area uh, tech company. Uh, and so, uh, I, and uh, my PCP is, is, is a large, is a relatively large network. Uh, is employed by a relatively large network, and um, I was I heeded my my peers. Some of my peers are masters in public health. They uh, advocated for uh, that, I, given my demographic, that I should really be proactive about my health and take a certain sort of blood test um, and talk to my doctor about it. And they said, you know, actually, you know, that's a good idea, especially if you know, given given you know how give, given your demographic. And so uh, I tried to. I said, all right, well, great. Given I have this large insurer. Uh, through my employer, I figure I'll use all their tools to shop for care for this specific blood test. Um, and uh, dozens of hours later, I didn't really have any answers. Um, I, I asked my provider for the order itself, and they said they would not transmit the order despite significant investment in their electronic systems. Uh, I had to pick it up in person uh, uh, from, from the office where I used to live, even though there's an office right down the block from me now where I moved. Um, and then after the test was performed in-house, because I... I, you know, I work a lot of hours, I couldn't you know, get it and then go find a Quest Diagnostics, and this is after being on the phone and online with my insurer, who's Aetna, by the way, I'm happy to drag their name through the mud. Um, <laughs> my doctor informed me that the wrong urine test had been performed, and so one of the procedures actually that was part of the panel, which I was told wouldn't be covered by my insurer in the first place, um, hadn't been done, and I said, that's funny because I didn't have a urine test, it was all blood. 
Uh, so so I, was, I was hoping the insurer would be on my side in this because I said, hey, listen, I want to work with you. I want to save you some money here. Um, I'm happy to like, look around uh, and find the cheapest test. And they were like, we're not sure that your PCP is part of our network, actually, uh, which wasn't true. Um, so my question for the panel, um, uh, and any one of you, I think, would be appropriate to answer this, is where will the incentive come from to help to ha for, for, for your sort of program to help people shop for this? Where, where is that incentive going to come from? Who's going to subsidize me to actually go to Quest Diagnostics and take that half-day PTO? Thanks. Thank you. Well, I hope you're all listening carefully. Great I think, questions. I think you've been given your marching orders here yeah. as far as <laughs> what you need to deliver to the public, and I hope you're doing it. Tobias? Tell, uh, so yeah. You've got yeah, a, a revised of model of care. What are the key attributes of that <clears throat> model of care? So the, the, key, the key attributes are, so a little bit about MetaClinic, which will actually include their key attributes. There are, someone was fortunate enough to like expand our, our game plan. It's not 1,300, but we have, do have over 1,100 um, clinics in 43 states. So big, big footprint. Over 50% over of America, all Americans, over 50% of Americans is within 10 miles of a minute clinic. So that's, yeah. that's a lot of, that's a big footprint and a lot of reach and a lot of capabilities of, um, of affecting change in a large population. The, the, we have over 3,000 nurse practitioners. Someone mentioned there, there are physician ex, um, nurse practitioners, a couple of physician assistants in some states, but for the most, most part, they're board certified, family practice trained nurse practitioners. It's a very lean model. There's a kiosk where you register and uh, verify your insurance, and then it's just the practitioner. That's who's doing all the administrative, all the clinical, all the, um, the, the back-end payment at the, at the end. So it's a very lean model. Um, I mention that only because of the, we're, we're certainly not at the nine to one overhead uh, ratio. And, and uh, so a couple of things. So open nights, weekends, holidays, in fact, about 50% of the patients that come, come during nights and weekends. So times when many other places are, are closed for business when it comes to providing health care. Insurance, although it was a cash pay business before my time there, it started as a cash pay business. It's now we're in, enrolled with over 300 different um, and contracted with over 300 different insurers. So about 90% about of the patients that come in um, use their third party coverage. So, so you've, and, and, and the prices are very transparent. They're right there, they're on the website. They're there when you walk in. So you can see exactly what it is that you'd be paying for that particular service. I'm trying to kind of go through each of the, each of the things that people have brought up. Um, we work very closely with other health systems in terms of connecting our electronic medical record with theirs so that there's not uh, an issue with fractionation of care. So if, if uh, and we, we align with, we have market leaders, um, Cleveland Clinic, Emory, UCLA, with all these institutions, we have two-way electronic medical record integration. So if a UCLA patient comes to one of our clinics in the LA area, we can see their meds, their allergies, and even their problem list. So the physician may say, you know, if you see this person before me, they're diabetic and they need their A1C, and I'm being paid in part on quality, and can you please, can you please fill these gaps in care? in addition for the reason why they're actually there. And then we, in turn, after the visit, can put the electronic medical record visit summary um, where the physician will be able to find it that belongs to that health system. So I think those are some of the ways in which um, we differentiate a little bit, but still try to work with the existing healthcare system. I'll stop the kick on. But Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, actually, I I was going to say something else about, uh, I'm working on a number of different projects. One of them is to get a dental, dentist extenders like physician extenders. But as I'm listening to you and the audience, um, I look at the, we've got to put the mouth back in the body. <laughs> it's one body. <laughs> and, and all you we're talking about is sort of epitomized in that we have this tremendous division between oral health care and everything else. And that makes absolutely no sense. So I'm thinking about the model you have, and I'm thinking to myself, well, why shouldn't I be able to go to a CVS mini clinic and get my shingles vaccine? Why can't I be inoculated against cavities? You know, why can't you put sealants and fluoride mm -hmm. on my teeth? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And thinking about dental care as any other part of the body, and thinking about it as um, inoculations, as, you know, essentially. Preventative care. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and we don't do that. And so all of the models that you're talking about Integrating the whole body would be, I think, a tremendous change. Yeah, that's a good point. 
Rashika? In the meantime, though, I have to say we're working on getting dental extenders, and it's been a project for 10 years, and it's, a bill is in the legislature for three it's years. <laughs> and we, we need to spend just a minute on that. We're going to get there. <laughs> we'll, we'll come back to that, because that's a current issue in Massachusetts yeah. that I think is really important. Rashika? Yeah. Yes, what we're doing is trying to rebuild the health system from the bottom up, right? I think there's a lot of talk about accountable care organizations are all sort of top down from these big hospitals. Mm -hmm. And we say maybe the right way to do it is the other way around. Start with where we, as consumers, interact with the system, with primary care, and then build up from there. And let's not start with primary care practices we have now, which are fragmented, reactive, mm -hmm. take a number. But why not start from scratch, right? In any other industry, if the incumbents were doing such a bad job, there'd be new entrants who'd come in and actually just do it differently. Think Southwest Airlines, think, you know, go down the list. And we don't have that very much in healthcare. So let's just start over. Uh, so we start over. A really a model has four pieces to it. The first is change the payment model. A lot of what's wrong with healthcare is this sort of fee for service system. If you ask what's the big problem with healthcare in this country, is that we've made it transactional. Everything's a transaction. Document, code, bill, next. Why you go to the doctor, it feels like you're a widget on a line, you know, your doctors feel like they're on a treadmill. Uh, and we said the thing that heals people are relationships, right? Particularly because chronic care is a big problem out there, and that's what relationship-based. So get rid of the transactions focused on relationships. So number one is we need a different payment model, which is based on value and improving people's health, not doing more stuff to people. Uh, that means what we have to do is we have to go and find people willing to do that. So we contract with big self-insured employers, and increasingly we're working in Medicare Advantage with Medicare Advantage plans. We have a practice here in, in, in Massachusetts, for instance, we have practices we see people from Tufts um, Medicare Advantage. So if any of you are seniors and want to experience this care, you can come to one of our practices. Uh, we also uh, work with the, we just started to sign, uh, with the Carpenters Union, and if you are carpenters, you can come and join. And then we just signed a contract with the GIC for the state employees, right? So we actually have, have picked payers off one at a time who are willing to do something different. Number two is you then build a completely different model around it. And again, our job is not walk in the door and see one patient at a time. Our job is we have a population of people there are a problem. How do we improve their health, keep them out of trouble, and do whatever it takes? So of course, we have doctors, but we also have people we call health coaches from the community, speak the language of the people they serve, pick for one thing only, which is empathy, and really help patients execute on the plan, right? So the doctor, I tell you, you should eat less, exercise more, take your medicines. Good luck, sucker. I'll see you in three months. And of course it doesn't work, yeah. right? So we need a human being to help you with all that stuff. We integrate mental health into the model. We've actually played with integrating oral health into mm -hmm. the model. Um, break down these barriers. Be proactive, not just reactive. Help people navigate the whole system like the, the story I talked about. Push back on the specialists. Co-manage in the hospital. It's not a little different. It's completely different. We've had to build a new IT platform. All these uh, epics of the world that people are spending billions of dollars on are not surprisingly built for the old system. Help you document, code, and bill higher. They're transactional. They're not actually improving care, uh, so we had to build our own. Uh, and then really, I think the key is changing the culture, right? Changing the culture of healthcare. Um, so we're doing this, we're in 35, we have 35 practices, we're tiny, 35 in 11 states. Uh, we doubling and tripling in size, and I think uh, the idea is let's just demonstrate that this is a better model for people. Rob? So based on the questions, obviously there's a lot of people that have had uh, not great experience with the healthcare system, and really, to the last uh, person who asked the question around what's the incentive. So we believe, you know, if we were created again, a service model would have the uh, patient with the information tools to actually behave like a consumer, right? Be able to shop, know what lab tests they're having and know what it's going to cost. So how many of you have asked your doctor in the last year uh, when you've seen them, what is this gonna cost me? Just to show hands. Anybody get an answer? No, keep your hands up. This is the interactive part. Anybody? Okay, we've got a couple. Um, that's part of the problem is even your doctors don't know. So part of it is putting the consumer first, right? Giving them the information to at least become informed. Uh, we also believe in a model where providing that same information to the actual physician. So what Tobias and Rushika have talked about, giving it point of sale. So you go into the minute clinic and let's say you need an MRI. You're not going to get an MRI in the minute clinic, but they're going to refer you to somebody. Having that information point of sale to say, you know what, you can have an MRI for 500 bucks if you go to this imaging center down the street. So right information, right place, right time to help guide those patients. And then ultimately, what we think is important is the patient is the one that's doing all the work, right? They're driving further, they're setting up the appointments, they're rescheduling, they're doing all the work. What's the reward for them in saving the system money? Nothing. So what we do is actually reward that patient for doing, uh, taking the time, voting with their feet. They're choosing to go to 
a more cost-effective option. They're generating savings for the insurance company, their employer, and so to the last question around what's the incentive in it for me, that's what our model is. We actually pay a share of the savings that that consumer just saved, their employer, their insurance company, back to that consumer in the form of a check. So really making it for uh, the consumer to have an interest, a financial interest, they're the one that's doing all the work, a shared savings model we think is a way to get more active consumer participation uh, in the overall model. Thank you, Rob. Yeah. I have a composite question I want to <clears throat> ask, but before I do, I want to say that after I ask my question, you're going to get another chance to stand up. You've now heard a brief description from these folks of what they're trying to do. We'd love to get your reactions as to whether you think it would be helpful to you and how helpful and what are they missing. Okay. Meanwhile, my question is, what on earth is wrong with fee-for-service? 95% of our economy, Rashika, <coughs> relies on fee-for-service. You go, you get your car fixed, whatever it is. What's wrong with that as a form of transaction? Second part of the question for Rob and Tobias is it seems to me if Rashika gets his way and he gets rid of fee-for-service, you two are out of business. Because you've got a business model based on yep. fee-for-service or, or rewards for for buying smarter mm -hmm. under a fee-for-service basis. So talk about it, guys. Yeah. It's, it's, you, can, you can jump in here, too. So maybe we'll clarify. Yeah. I think there are many things for which fee-for-service is a great thing. I think if you go to the Miniclink, that is a transaction. And I think that's, it's appropriate to pay a fair price for that. I think what we're doing, which is primary care, let's actually help people improve their health and stay out of trouble, that's not a transactional thing. Right, that's a relational thing. And so we ought to pay fee-for-service for what's fee-for-service. We ought to you know, pay in a relationship-based way things that are relationship. Now, what we do is we love tools like this, right? So we say, um, again, if, if uh, we need a thing done and the Minute Clinic's the cheapest place to get it after hours, by all means, you should go to a Minute Clinic and not an ER, right? That's a no-brainer. If we need to set best, find the best place to get an MRI for someone, by all means, we need tools to help figure out where that is. Now, by the way, the existing system not only doesn't tell you, they make it really hard for you to find out you know, what these prices are. And, and to me, the fact you can hide prices when consumers uh, have to pay it, it seems to be criminal. It seems like we ought, to, we ought to fix that. And I think we keep trying to do that in the legislature, and, and the existing providers make excuses why they can't. I think you should just make them do it. Post a price list, period. It does. Can I add something in this uh, I was thinking of? So in the oral health component of the healthcare system, um, consumers do pay mm -hmm. because over half the expense is paid by consumers. They do know. I mean, if you ask your dentist what a crown is, they will tell you. Yeah. They don't shop no. um, and they have information. And one of the things we did was create a model uh, practice um, to see if you could practice in a medical model instead of a surgical model and explaining to a patient that, you know, we're gonna remineralize your tooth, this is what it means, and you're gonna go and buy a prescription toothpaste, it's, here's the Rx number, and we're gonna, you know, use behavioral conversations to modify yeah. behavior, and then they had to pay for it. And they don't wanna pay for that. <laughs> they wanted to pay for something, but you didn't do anything, so maybe $35. Um, but I'm perfectly willing to pay the 190 for the filling. So it's a very complex situation. Yeah. I and in, I would have loved to run that clinic, frankly, and had a global payment and not have yeah. the conversations. And then we would have made a promise to everybody, you'll never get a cavity if you're here. So Rob, Tobias, yeah. are you okay? Yeah. Is Rashika an ally? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think so. I think, you know, from, from our standpoint, we're, we're um, it is much, I would say, a transactional basis saying that we are starting to partner and starting to look at how you work with large health systems that do have a capitated model for at least some of their patients, you know, where they're, where they're mm -hmm. getting paid a single sum or a PM, PM for, to take care of a patient population. And trying to think what role can not only Minute Clinic but CVS play in this. So we know that a large component of people yeah. being rehospitalized has to do with their medications. Yeah. And is there a role that, you know, that Minna Clinic and even the pharmacy can play in, in taking some risk and in going into um, those arrangements? So I would say that it's currently uh, fee-for-service, but it doesn't necessarily, I, I wouldn't, I, I think there are solutions around even if the healthcare system starts aligning better healthcare with payment, which, which I'm a fan mm -hmm. of, I, I think there's still a, a path forward for, for, for our business. So I, I completely agree, and I think where we, 
want the industry to go is fixed pricing in healthcare, where you'd be able to say, well, what is this going to cost me? And they can tell you. They can list it on the door. Right. And let's say you go in and have that procedure done. What's wrong with the warranty period, right? You know, you didn't actually fix it the first time. I want my money back, or you're going to fix it this next time, and I'm not going to pay anymore. So when we look at really successful models, we actually believe in competition. Uh, to give an example in New Hampshire, so we were featured on NBC Nightly News um, with Lester Holt. Interesting story, talk about one of the patients that we have. So she's on a drug called Remicade, manufactured by Johnson Johnson, high cost infusible. You go in, you sit down in a chair, you read a book, you watch a movie, no physician, no surgeon in sight, right? This is an infusible drug to treat Crohn's disease, rheumatoid arthritis. $22,000 in effusion at the local hospital. This patient lives three miles down the road from the local hospital, 22,000 bucks a wax, she goes every four months. We guided her to an outpatient infusion site, same drug, come for your chair, better, friendlier staff out front, no difference in quality, better patient experience, $3,500 all in fixed price. So that's the kind of competition that we think fee for service is a symptom of the problem, but we think the provider community and the healthcare community should be competing based on cost and quality. And so being able to bring that information available to consumers and making physicians and the system compete for those patients, there's only so many hips uh, available, but we have more orthopedic surgeons than we know what to do with, so they are competing for a finite uh, set of hips to operate on. So we have a capacity excess, and so as a patient, you should be able to find the best physician to treat you at a much lower cost and have a really high quality outcome. So moving the model forward to be able to arm people with that information, we think a reward component is a way to get you in the front door and engage and having conversations about, uh, you know, why does it cost this much? Uh, you know, at this location, why can't I go down the street? So really arming the consumer with that information. I, I think you under, need to understand <clears throat> that what they're all discussing would be truly transformation should it go into effect and spread widely. Because right now, those general hospitals, those academic medical centers, are basically cost centers in search of revenue streams. <laughs> mm -hmm. They are. Mm -hmm. Tremendous overhead, tremendous fixed costs, and so on. When you disintermediate, that's highly threatening to so, the status quo. So if, if I can just make it a comment on that. So um, our program is called Smart Chopper. We're based out of New Hampshire. We serve um, self-funded employers and health plants uh, all over the country. When we first went live with the state employees in New Hampshire, the first seven calls into our call center were not from patients. They were from the CEO, COO, or CFO of the major hospital systems in New Hampshire. And what are you people doing up there? You're going to pay people by publishing what our costs are. Um, and they said, well, how do I rank higher on the list? And I said, well, you've got to charge people less. <laughs> so we chuckled about that. <laughs> Easy for Kind of an uncomfortable <laughs> moment of silence. And they said, no, really, how do we get higher on the list? And well, that's between you and the insurance company. You agreed to these prices. We're simply just making it available. Um, and in all the markets in which we operate, we've seen providers come back to the table and lower their rates because they're trying to compete for business out there. So think of it, you have your independent docs, or you have your um, freestanding imaging sites, or you have your ambulatory surgical centers that have been treating patients for decades for a fraction of the price, what's the point of being a low-cost provider if no one cares about price? You're just giving your services away. So now that price is becoming more and more of a topic of conversation, we're forcing people to compete. So take that Revocate example, that hospital uh, system, that one patient is saving our client well over $100,000 a year, one patient. You are absolutely certain, to Paul's point, that medical system knows exactly who we are, and they just watched $100,000 walk out the door with a smile on her face. So they absolutely take notice. So we moved to a model which is 100% dominated. Now there's three home health infusion providers in the state and nine places you can go because we've helped create that competition. So that's the kind of model that we're moving towards, which is really giving people the ability to shop and vote with their feet and drive competition. Your turn. Stand up, tell us what you think about what they said. You like it? You nervous? Uh, yes. <clears throat> I, I live in uh, Plainfield, New Hampshire, and I'm 15 miles from one of the best medical centers in the world, in my opinion, at Dartmouth-Hitchcock. 
in New Hampshire was just ask them; they'll tell you. That. <laughs> <laughs> well, they they are they are certainly an oligopoly and on the way to monopoly, but they don't yet behave like a monopoly. Okay, we could train them. In my opinion, <laughs> <laughs> Boston could train them in that in the wrong direction. True, but New Hampshire was the first state to get. Uh, an A grade in having the Health and Human Services Department set up a website that produced price transparency yes. on the common procedures. So, so the first question is, are you linked with them or uh, collaborating with them or was this totally two separate uh, issues? So the, the, uh, the question, so New Hampshire does have a phenomenal website. They're the first in the country to really take transparency from a legislative standpoint and put it out there. You can shop a whole host of services and find out what the price is, whether you've got Blue Cross Blue Shield, Aetna Cigna, whomever. Nobody uses it. So this information has been available for a decade. Uh, when you look at the transparency tools, uh, Catalyst for Payment Reform did a study that said 98% of health plans have transparency mm -hmm. tools yeah, available helpful. for consumers. They're not, they're not usable. 2% use them. So the information's out there. It's either impossible to find or you are so nervous because your Dartmouth physician said, I'm going to schedule you um, at this Dartmouth facility. And you as a consumer say, well, who am I to question my doctor? So the information's out there. There has to be a hook to get people to stop and pay attention. So, well, why is it you want me to go to that location? So personal story, Dartmouth, um, my, my daughter, my oldest daughter, is a ballerina, so she probably has 1% body fat, right? So she goes and sees her PCP, which we love, um, and they say, you know what? She, she might have a heart murmur. Well, any medical professional could tell you well, she's 1% body fat. You can hear a lot everything. more. Yeah, yeah, you can hear everything, right? Um, <laughs> immediately, we're into the uh, pediatric cardiologist. So, you know, here we go, right? Yeah, and, and I'm in the industry. I'm sitting the there being like, okay, this is going to yeah. be fun. So I go in. Um, EKG, and then we're talking about, you know, the different types of murmurs. There's 200 murmurs, not really many of them are lethal, <laughs> da, 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 da. And so at the end of it, he's like, well, I'm going to write up a test to um, have your daughter checked out. We think we want to do, um, you know, the next level up. We'll, go, we'll start with an ultrasound, and then we'll move our way up to a CAT scan. I said, well, okay. Um, what do you think you're actually going to prove? Uh, nothing, just peace, peace of mind. Like, do you think there's anything wrong with her? No, not, there's nothing wrong with her. We just want to make sure that you felt comfortable. So rule out everything. It, it, yeah. you, you've got to train the consumer to ask questions and behave differently. So your, your question, New Hampshire led the nation in transparency. The information is available. Nobody uses it. So we are a separate organization um, outside of that. We have no affiliation uh, with, with that, but we do applaud the effort that both they and other states across the country are trying to do to move, the fo move forward transparency. We think it's important to be able to have a tool and a resource uh, to allow consumers to find out what things cost. We think that's in the best public interest. We just happen to wrap a shopping service around it to make it a two-minute phone call, a couple of mouse clicks online. But, uh, we did the heavy lifting. Are you in multiple states yet or just focused on New Hampshire? Oh, no. We're in a number of states all over the country. Here in New Hampshire, we work with um, two um, health insurers, soon to be a third and potentially a fourth. Uh, GIC was mentioned there. We have a pilot going with Unicare with the state employees in GIC. So we work with uh, employers, large employers, small employers across the country. Thank you for the question. Thank you. So you were talking about Remicade, and my husband actually has Crohn's disease, and he has Remicade. I'm very well aware of how much it costs. Um, I also can tell you that we have a high deductible health plan, <laughs> and um, <laughs> I feel like another big piece of the puzzle is like what insurance is paying, what they're not paying, yeah. the reimbursement you get from the drug makers, all of that. I'm a small business owner. I have a bookkeeper that helps me with all the QuickBooks. About you know two weeks ago, I'm thinking, who can I hire to do the <laughs> finances for my health care to help keep track? Because I'm getting bills. I'm pretty sure I paid that. Yeah. Um, they said that I met my deductible on April 14th, and yet I'm getting a bill for something that happened on the 16th, so I don't really think that I owe that. And I know that the drug maker is going to be reimbursing, but that hasn't cleared yet, so maybe I should wait until that gets cleared because yeah, I probably pay. won't owe don't that pay. because then yeah. I'll have met my deductible. Don't pay. It's, don't pay. It's crazy. So I just think you can educate consumers about what things cost, but then to help educate them on you know, what the co-pays are versus the co-insurance yeah. versus your deductible and keeping so track of all of those finances, especially when you're talking about 
20, 20 to $30,000 worth of medical expenses between yeah. the deductibles that I pay as a small yeah. business owner and the high deductible yeah. plans and all that it's kind of stuff. It's, it's too much to put on the consumer. The system is sort of rigged, by the way, against you. There are all sorts of, so the PBMs are one thing. There's these secret rebates that are coming in that you don't know about, that people are getting under the table. I think it's, it's shady, right? In any other industry, secret kickbacks are illegal. In healthcare, it's sort of common. And also <laughs> stupid things. So you, know, so you go and you've got a plan. Uh, Obamacare says if preventive tests are covered 100%. So you go in for a colonoscopy, right? If they find nothing, it's free. Uh, if they find a little thing, it's no longer preventive. You have to pay for the whole thing under your high deductible plan. And you have no idea when you walk in, right? There are all sorts yeah. of really stupid structural that things about how the system works, which are not geared for consumers. They're geared to let the industry make more money. So on, on that note real quick, so uh, we, we talk a lot about colonoscopy. It's one of the most, well, it's, um, it's the most frequently prescribed outpatient surgery in the country. They don't call it scoping for dollars for nothing in the medical community. <laughs> Um, it's one of the highest cost variation services in, in the country. So um, you as a patient have no idea what they're going to find. Your, gastro your gastroenterologist has no idea what they're going to find. It could cost nothing yeah. to you as a consumer or 5000 bucks. No what percentage of the time do you think people, they find something when they're doing a colonoscopy? <laughs> in our data, it's north of 60%. Yeah. So you have a 60% chance of thinking it's free walking out with the bill. Crazy. So designing models, back to... Um, global bundling and fixed price care, there should be one cost for a colonoscopy. They're doing the exact same thing, right? So regardless of what happens to you, it's a fixed price. You should know what it is up front. So absolutely the system uh, is not in favor of the consumer and trying to have tools to help them manage both the information and as the, the prior uh, person asked, helping them manage that financial responsibility because it's a bigger and bigger portion of their, their take home pay, helping them manage that new financial responsibility that they have. Sir. Just, just had a question for you. Uh, I think it's great that you're trying to create uh, spread compression through transparency like this. We did in my business an investment back when the New York Stock Exchange went from trading in eights to pennies, and then obviously volumes improved and revenues improved. So there was a benefit after the fact with higher volumes, bigger, deeper liquidity, what have you. My question would then be, as a devil's advocate, the law of un unintended consequences here. What about orphan drug development that depends on small universe, higher margin, and things of this nature. Will this cast a pallor on orphan drug development, knowing full well that there's going to be uh, beatdowns on margin compression immediately under your system? Something to just consider. So uh, in terms of uh, pharmaceuticals, and, and that's a whole, whole other conference issue. for yeah. some yeah. other time yeah. around how we fund drugs, uh, you know, drugs uh -huh. in this country. Um, we don't, uh, we don't make the prices, we simply just make them available. And so uh, we're not gonna cure all the, the ills and the sins of the healthcare system, but we believe that competition and getting the consumer to pay attention uh, is certainly a step in the right direction. So absolutely, we don't, we're not gonna put any hospital out of business uh, because what we know is you may be really high cost on hip replacement, but through no rhyme or reason, you have an unbelievably competitive MRI price. The pricing is completely out of whack. So uh, we don't think we're going to put anybody out of business, but we do think that competitive uh, forces will help to lower the overall cost. Well. Um, so my question involves sort of value-based cost and sort of who, if we're going to start paying based on the value of a said treatment, who is going to decide the value or cost <laughs> of that treatment. Um, and specifically, sometimes the issue is, you know, if we just used Google to solve all our problems, then we wouldn't have to worry about the person on the other end who is using evidence-based medicine and clinical experience to care for us. Um, and I think an issue, and maybe you can address this issue of, you know, non-physicians assigning a value to a particular treatment or medication or whatnot. Um, when they don't have that clinical experience or, you know, experience with patients. So I'm not a clinician, so I'm going to let my doctor friends <laughs> answer, uh, answer that question. It's, it's an intriguing theory. So, so, so have, <laughs> have like a panel of, of non-medical people set the prices for like the procedures and for medical care? How so? 
How is, are you saying that's happening now? Ah, uh, because the non non clinical people who are the insurance companies are setting the prices for what you can contract with them for reimbursement. So in every sure. other part yeah. of the economy, we allow some version of market mechanism to actually set prices, right? So I think any version of uh, bureaucrats sitting in a room setting prices, we have seen this over and over again, doesn't work, right? And I think that's sort of what we're doing now. I think to the extent that we allow some version of competitive dynamics to figure out what the price that clears the market, that actually works better. But that requires informed consumers, um, and that's where our, our bet is having a doc help you make these decisions, because you have to weigh not just the price, but then the value, right? So you go in, you've got chest pain, and you've got a VQ scan or a helical CT to see if you've got to rule out a PE. Well, which one should you do? Well, it depends on what their symptoms are, it depends on what the prices are, right? And right now, the people making all decisions have a vested interest in taking money from you, right, as opposed to sort of working for you. Um, so I think that's what we need a lot more of, is sort of more transparency and more information, and then advocates to help you sort of make those decisions. Yeah, I want to add on to the information part, which I talked about briefly before, um, because it is asymptomatic. And we have, we've talked about price transparency, but we haven't talked about decision support tools. Yeah. Right. And that's incredibly important. Um, wisdom teeth. Um, $4 billion a year, asymptomatic wisdom teeth. Um, they get removed. There's really no, no reason for most of them to be removed in the first place, whether it's a $2,000 or $5,000. Is that true? Absolutely. <laughs> look, these are asymptomatic well, wisdom teeth. There is no symptom. We are doing things like, well, you know, we might as well do all four at once because it's easier when you're 18 than when you may be. Yep. Six. There is, yep. So yep. a decision support tool um, in addition to pricing. Yeah. I don't want to focus okay. just on the cost. Oh, absolutely. Last question. Hi, good evening. Um, thanks for everything that you do. I, uh, I'm very much like the, uh, the market approach and the uh, uh, consumer decision support, and I'm, I'm a big fan of, of the fee-for-service model, and, and I, just for full disclosure, I'm one of those people who works on the finance side for one of the large systems here who uh, tries, to, not that one, the other one, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, try, to, try to figure out you know, you know, how to, how, how to get reimbursed appropriately and whatever that means, really. Uh, and I, th I agree that uh, cost transparency is a problem because we all don't really know what the actual cost usually is, uh, even at that level where we're looking at the numbers. Uh, there, there were a few moments there that, that triggered me because you brought up the Remicade. And uh, one thing that, uh, with everything that you can do at this level that you talked about, but uh, one big portion that causes problems that we haven't discussed yet is the uh, role of the government in this. Um, a large driver in, in how cost is set is actually CMS. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. um, all the other peers follow suit as they see fit usually, but usually they just uh, go along with what random decision was made by CMS. Um, to, you know, to go with your Remicade example, um, your $22,000 patient uh, may not have another choice because if it's a Medicare patient, they're not allowed to go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Uh, they have to buy from the expensive hospital pharmacy mm -hmm. because Medicare requires that. Um, just been through that process. Um, there's, there's all these inefficiencies. And then uh, I personally always take a little bit issue that we really, do we really have a cost problem? Because the consumer decision could also be, do I really want to go for the cheapest service or do I actually want to, because of this information gap, do I want to go with the most expensive service? If I, God forbid, get diagnosed with cancer tomorrow, where do I go? Mm -hmm. Not to the clinic down the street. I go around the corner here to you know, the fabulous cancer center and, and hope that they take care of me because I have this information gap at that point. I want the best care, so I go for the most expensive model. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's what a lot of people do. And I think mm -hmm. there's, there's enough available discretionary spending in this country actually available uh, that people will continue to do this no matter what model we choose. Uh, I've worked and practiced in, in other countries. I, I'm originally from Germany. Uh, I would warn people against going that route with these cheaper systems because you end up with something that is really far worse, even though the WHO tries to convince you otherwise. But I've seen it firsthand. You don't even get real data because everything gets swept under the rug. Whereas here, everything is transparent when it comes to at least clinical outcomes. So just my two cents, and mm -hmm. all this is evolving around what is the role of government in this. and in their 
setting the prices. You can maybe have a choice with picking an MRI, but anything that is more complex than that, you get lost even when you work in, that, in the industry. I, I think um, those, are, those are great points. And I, for one, feel very relieved that before Friday of this week, Congress is going to fix this. <laughs> uh, so it, no, it, you, you've raised really some like. very serious points. And uh, from my experience in Europe, you're, you're exactly right. There's, uh, there's a tendency for us to look at Europe <clears throat> and say, well, they get a lot more for their money and spend less of GDP on, on health care. Well, I've been in places like Denmark where they spend a lot less, but where the public is now demanding in terms of cancer care and cardiac care, they're saying, how come we don't get the same quality and depth of care that the US has? <laughs> and the, the parliament over there is all of a sudden seeing a dramatic increase mm -hmm. in healthcare costs because they're building more hospitals, more tertiary centers, more coordinated centers <laughs> for that kind yeah. of care. So it appears to me looking worldwide that these various systems are converging, wh whether it's uh, our unregulated, more private system with a a third or a fourth or half publicly funded to theirs, which are mainly publicly funded with a parallel private system, over time they start to look a lot like each other. Um, so, Jim, at the next session, um, <laughs> yeah. I think we can handle that. I, I want to thank the panelists for their participation and turn it over to Chuck for closing remarks. No, 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 that one's signed to you. Oh, sorry. Well, thank, thank all of our panelists and, and, and Paul for moderating this and all of you for driving the, uh, the program forward. I am interested that until Paul decided we were going to have another session to address it, the subject of what the hell the government's doing to help this didn't really get into the conversation at all, uh, including what the government's doing, which might obviate everything that you're trying to do up here, uh, and uh, let alone, which is, the, which is the best answer? Uh, you know, we had Romney care, we had Obamacare, we have Obamacare, we have something coming, maybe, uh, <laughs> but it's unclear that any of that helps any of the stuff we were talking about. But the interesting thing of this lecture series is it really started as a lecture. Uh, it was a Colby Hewitt lecture that was put on by the Beth Israel Deaconess when Paul was the CEO and by the Pioneer uh, when, uh, with Jim uh, because uh, a lot of you folks and other folks like you had contributed to both of those organizations that were important to my dad uh, when he passed away. And so they both had some money from that. And they said, what, you know, well, what, what, what should we do with this? We really think we ought to do more with this than just reinvest it in our mission and they decided this would be the thing to do. So Paul was kind enough in the, in the first lecture to say, I'll, I've got the venue, I've got the place we can do it, we, we've got the capability of putting it on, we'll put it on at the BID. Jim said, well, we've got the ability to put together the, 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 the structure and, and, the, and, and the speaker, and, and we'll take that. So the first speaker that we had was, was a guy from Louisiana whose specialty was uh, governmental solutions that were being considered all around the country. And this great talk all put together, and he gets on a plane, flies up here to give the talk, and that day they passed Romney Care in Massachusetts. And so he got up and he said, well, I had this great talk, but now you've taken the talk away from me because you're already done. <laughs> I mean, I, I, what I was going to talk about, I can't talk about anymore, which are all the different things you could do, you've already done this. So, so he did talk about what we did. But since then, uh, a lot of folks like you, and it's great that you all are here tonight, have showed an interest in continuing this forward. And it's, it's been a little bit like stone soup. That first set of contributions started it. Uh, your interest has continued it. Uh, the folks who have come before you in, in prior years have contributed to it. Uh, Jim has put together an endowment that funds it. And as long as we have a buck in, in, in the kitty, uh, and we have the interest of folks like these guys who are willing to answer the call. We'll continue to put it on. So anyone here who thought this was worth doing and would like to see it done again and maybe have Paul and the panel address the government thing that he 
Uh, that, that could be even a longer session. Um, please, if, if you feel so inclined, as Pete Peters would always say, if you have a charitable urging, please act on it. Uh, and Pioneer can be found easily and just send them some dough. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you.